Uh, if you would, please find in your copies of God's Word uh, the book of Romans and find chapter 12. We're continuing our series <coughs> through gospel hospitality and taking a look at, at, at what it means to be hospitable, uh, hospitable with, with the gospel as a, a source of that hospitality, and hospitality within the church walls. Uh, the book of Romans was a letter written in the first century by a man named Paul to a group of churches in Rome. So I hope that you have found Romans 12 in your copies of God's Word. The age of uh, social media is, is a fun one. It's done a lot for our society. I think that social media both has positive and negative uh, consequences. Um, but one thing that it has definitely done uh, is it has created within us something that um, people have termed FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. As a, a term that was coined in 2004 in an article by Patrick McGinnis, it means fear of missing out. And it's this, it's this idea that we are missing out on something in life. We are missing out on experiences. We are missing out on people events, whatever it may be. We see the lives that people are living out there, and we say, man, things are way better out there for other people than they are for me. It creates in us an anxiety that what we have going on isn't as good or isn't good enough, period. It's this idea that gets into our heads that everyone out there, out there is experiencing a better life than us. People are having fun and they're living their best life. They're going on awesome vacations. They have perfect families. They're driving awesome cars. They have super clean houses, right? FOMO doesn't just occur on social media. It can happen anywhere for any reason at any time. But I think that a big problem that churches are facing is that Christians in this room right here, right now, it's not just fear of missing out. You guys are actually missing out on an awesome opportunity that is right here within our church. Not only are, are you missing out on, on an opportunity, but you're not experiencing the fullness of God, the fullness of the church in your daily walk with Jesus. And that opportunity is gospel hospitality within the church. Gospel hospitality within the church. And we're going to build on this. We're going to expand on what this looks like. But what becomes evident as we move through the New Testament is that love, hospitality, generosity, these are all clear-cut signs of someone that has been changed by grace. These are marks of a, cru of a true Christian. In much the same way uh, as you would expect someone that says, hey, hey, I'm a, I'm a diehard, lifelong Royals fan. You would expect them to know who Buddy Bianca Lana is. Who's Buddy Bianca Lana? I have no idea. Pastor Derek told me about him. <laughs> but he's, he's important enough that Pastor Derek knows about him, and he says, hey, that's kind of a litmus test for, for Royals fans. Or the same way that if, if there's someone that says, hey, I'm a diehard, lifelong Chiefs fan, you know who Elvis Gerbach is. Again, I don't know who that is. But when someone makes that claim and says, hey, I'm, I'm such and such, right? There, there are litmus tests. There, there are things that you put them up against to say, are you really? Where were you in 1985? What kind of radio did you listen to? Where were you when the last out of the such and such happened? And it's the same way when people claim to be a Jesus follower, when someone says they are a Jesus follower, we put them up against litmus tests to determine if they are actually a Jesus follower. And those are found right here in Romans 12. Paul is going to give us some tests to say, hey, if, if you claim that you are a true Christian, here's some things that you would expect a true Christian to have to do. We know that someone is internally changed by their outward behavior. And so what I hope to show you is that these commands aren't just moral teachings from Paul. 
What I mean is that this isn't, what, what Paul's going to give us this morning, what I hope to show you from this passage is that this isn't just, hey, you need to be a better person. Hey, you need to try harder. Hey, you need to do these things and live a better life and have a greater impact on community. It's more than just that, but these flow directly from the transformation that we see earlier in the chapter. So if you would, uh, please take a look at verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12. And this, this is the source of, of what we see. This is what Paul says, Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this is what Paul says. He says, in light of what we know about God, in light of his mercies, in light of his love, in light of all the awesome things that God has done for us, our response should be transformation. Our response is to be changed and transformed by the gospel, to believe on the gospel. And as a result of that, when we realize these truths in our heart, these will naturally flow out of us when we are changed by Jesus. So let's go ahead and let's jump right in. Romans 12 will be in verses 9 through 13 this morning. If you would, please take a look at verse 9. He says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Paul opens up this section with a banner for what he is going to present to us and to the church in Rome. Everything else is a support in this section for this one phrase, let love be genuine. If you're someone that, that feels comfortable writing in your Bible, highlighting whatever it may be, underline, highlight, circle, whatever it may be, that phrase, let love be genuine. He wants the love of Christians to be sincere. He's going to show us what this looks like in a little bit. He's going to expand on this. But I think it's worth mentioning that Paul assumes within a body of Jesus followers, within a church, that love is already present within the church. And he wants to make sure that that love is genuine, that that love is sincere. He doesn't say, hey, make sure that you guys are loving each other. He doesn't say, hey, make sure that you guys aren't acting like fools up in there. He says, make sure that the love that is already present within you is genuine and sincere. He's going to expand on that. We're going to take a little bit of a, of a deeper dive into what that genuine, looks, uh, that genuine love looks like. He says, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Abhor, right? Your translation uh, may say hate, or despise, or, 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 or do away with. Hate. What is evil is a very strong word. Hate what is evil in your life, in, in, in your relationships, in the way that you treat others. Cling and hold fast to what is good. And the way that we tell what is, what is good and what is evil, right? It can be subjective out there. Some people uh, say, oh, well, this, this is love. This is what love is. These are good things. These are things that you should hold on to. What we have determined what good and evil is, is by holding it up against Scripture. Right here, God determines what is good and what is evil. God tells us what is right and what is wrong. We see in Scripture what God calls evil. We see in Scripture what God calls good. Abhor what is evil. But he also says, hold fast. Cling to what is good. It's, it's this picture of holding on for dear life. Use every ounce of strength that you have to hold on to the good that is in the love that you have for one another. Parents, you are totally with me on this. Imagine, go back to that day when you took your teenager driving for the first time. You held on for dear life, right? Right? If you haven't gotten there, you will at some point. But it's that, you know, you have the five seat belts, right? You got the, the, the crash helmet on, and you are holding on 
for dear life. If I had more time, I'd tell you the story about the time that, it, that my dad took me driving for the first time. Um, but I ended up going the wrong way on the wrong side of the road. I don't even want to tell you that it happened. It was awful. My dad uh, saw his life flash before his eyes there. Anyway, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Practically speaking, students in this room, I want to speak to you for a second to the students, to the teenagers that are in this room somewhere. If you have a relationship, whether it's friend, whether it's dating, whether it's that weird nebulous, you haven't defined the relationship, you don't know what it is right now, right? But the relationship that you have with someone, if that person is not leading you to good, if that person is leading you to evil, and to sin, that is not real love. Despite what that person may tell you, that is not real love. Because genuine love, what Paul tells us, is it clings to what is good. It leads us to God. So if that's not the love that you have in that relationship, it's not real love. For the adults in this room, as you take a look at the relationships that you have with others, are you holding on to what is good? Are you encouraging each other and spurring them on to holiness? That's what this looks like. And if we're going to show gospel hospitality within our church, it has to start with love. Just the sheer number of times uh, that, that in the New Testament it is mentioned that Christians should love Paul saw it as one of the more important defining characteristics of a Christian. Genuine love must exist within us as Jesus followers. And Paul's going to give us a deeper look into that and how Christian relationships would be. Take a look at verse 10 in your Bibles. He says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Paul continues to expand on on genuine love, and he gives us this command to love one another with brotherly affection. The love that you have for one another should move just beyond surface-level pleasantries. It should be more than just, hey, how's your day going? Great, awesome, good to see you. The love that we should have for one another should propel us to viewing each other as family, The people in this room are not just people that you go to church with. It's not just, oh, hey, they're in my my Sunday school class. But these are your brothers and your sisters. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. They're family. And because of that spiritual truth, we should love them with a deep familial bond. Paul's going to give us a little bit more practicality here. He tells us in this next phrase, to outdo one another in showing Honor, this is a unique phrase that occurs really only here once in the New Testament. And it's the only place where Paul encourages us to be competitive with one another, which is really interesting when you think about it. And the heart behind this is that we should be eager and anxious to give other people credit in church. Right? This goes against everything that is within us. We want the credit. We want people to recognize us. We want people to say, hey, you did a great job on this. But our command here is to deflect that to someone else and, and elevate other people. We should find ways to elevate other people within the church. We should keep a scorecard for how often we lift each other up. Don't actually keep a scorecard because that's weird. All right, But metaphorically, we should have a scorecard where we give people credit and honor and praise. Take a look at verse 11. He says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Paul moves on to another statement. This word uh, of encouragement is, is in the midst of exhortations to love and care for one another. Paul's basically telling us, hey, hey, don't lose steam with what you're doing. He says, I know it can be daunting. I know that it can be easy for you to kind of, man, this is hard to do this every single day and every single week. He says, keep going. Do those things with passion and with zeal. This word uh, for slothful 
is a word that means to hold back, to show reluctance or to hesitate. Paul says, don't hold back on these things. Don't hesitate to fulfill these commands. This is not something that Paul wants you to to draw from your own strength. Take a look at that middle phrase right there. Be fervent in spirit. Paul is telling us, hey, this comes from the spirit. When you have the spirit indwelling within you, when the spirit is is spurring you on and, and fueling you and driving you, these things will come naturally out of you. Be on fire with the Spirit. Let the Spirit consume you and drive you and fuel you. In order for us to be hospitable, to love one another with brotherly affection, to outdo one another with showing honor and all the things that come with this, we need close communion with God. But more than that, we need daily close communion with God. And we'll get into that in just a minute. And finally, Paul gives us a phrase, serve the Lord. Paul tells us to serve the Lord. He gives us a direction for this zeal, this zeal and this passion. It's, it's sometimes a tendency for us when we hear these phrases of, of be on fire with the Spirit, right? Zeal and, and let the Spirit consume you, right? We, we think, oh, well, that's just emotions, that's just self-seeking attention. That's just, that's just something where, where it, it, it fizzles out and there's no direction. But Paul gives it direction right here. These things should drive us to be hospitable to one another, but ultimately with the end goal of serving the Lord. It should drive us to give attention to him and glory to him. And the way that we do that is by serving the Lord and loving others. Take a look at verse 12. He says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. When we put these things into practice, when we live this out as a Jesus follower, we're able to live differently. We're able to stand out in a good way. We're able to have hope and remain patient when things go awry. These things are quickly linked to a prayer life. Paul knows better than most that that when you're putting yourself into a position as a Jesus follower to show hospitality, to serve the Lord, to do all the things, that you're going to be put into dark moments, that you're going to be put into chaos. And the life of a Jesus follower is not free from difficulty. When we choose to follow Jesus, God doesn't spare us from trials. But we are given hope and we're given the ability to stand strong in those trials. Psalm 46 gives us a a better picture than most. And you don't have to turn there. The words will be behind me on the screen. And I'm going to read it to you. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. See, God's promise to us in the midst of difficulty, in the, in, in the midst of, of living out your, your calling as a Jesus follower, isn't that he's going to stop the chaos. It's not that he's going to stop the trials and the trouble and he's going to give you an easy life. But God's promise is that he will be with you in the chaos that God will be with you in those dark times. When we're faced with difficulty, when we're faced with adversity, we can stand in those things because we're grounded in God through his word and through prayer. When we let the gospel permeate our life, we can trust in Jesus with every aspect of our life and we're able to live differently. We're able to stand out and show what it means to be transformed by the gospel. Finally, take a look at verse 13. He says, contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Here is the, is the heart of what this passage boils down to. And, and this is really uh, where, where we're going to find our landing spot. We're invited to contribute to the needs of the saints. Immediately, this, this likely brings to, to mind images of, hey, you need to give more financially. And that's true, but I think what Paul had in mind here was more than just financial giving. More than just giving physical items to the needs of the saints, right? Coats, hats, clothing, food, and so on. 
And I don't want to take away from the people here at Blue Valley who may be struggling with that because I do think that we have families that are in need of physical items, that are in need of monetary aid. But for the most part, I think the bigger need that Blue Valley Church has is not so much a physical need, but rather a need for people to come alongside and serve and help in our ministries. And I'm going to expand on this in just a little bit. But the important part to remember is that Paul has in mind this idea that community costs you something. You can't come to church with a a consumer mindset. We can't come to church and just say, hey, what does the church do for me? But rather coming in and saying, what can I do for the church? Taking a look at our our local church and saying, where are those biggest needs and and how can I help fill those? We'll touch on that just in, in, in a little bit. But I'm telling you, this next generation that's coming up, little kids, big kids, student ministry, They need people to teach them. They need people to invest in them, to build a relationship, to show them hospitality, to give them the gospel. Finally, take a look back at at verse 13. He says to seek to show hospitality. Seek. Find ways, right? Again, if you're one of those people, circle, underline, rectangle, whatever that word, seek. Seek. Find ways to show hospitality. Be relentless in finding ways to be hospitable. Hospitality is not passive. Opportunities rarely, if ever, just fall into your lap. If you want to fulfill this call to be hospitable, we need to be active and find ways to do it. We need to be active in our way that we approach this. So here's here's your one point for today. All this boils down to this. Genuine believers should overflow with hospitality to one another. The reason for all this, the reason why we do this is because of Jesus. Jesus was active in the way that he sought us. Jesus was active in his love for us. Jesus loved us with brotherly affection. He uh, sought to be fervent in spirit and so on. Jesus is the embodiment of this passage. And he lived out these truths in every possible way perfectly. You are called to follow Jesus. You are called to more than just reading your Bible daily, more than just going to church, more than just praying before meals. You are called to follow Jesus' example in every way. And gospel hospitality begins right here in this room. We cannot possibly fully live out this call until we have done it here. It needs to start here before we even take it outside these walls. I want you to go back real quickly and take a look at these words that Paul uses in this passage. He says, don't be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, rejoice in hope, outdo one another in showing honor, seek to show hospitality. These are active words. These are energetic words. Words. Paul is trying to show us that this is more than just something that's going to happen on its own, that this requires action. It requires us to do something. So first off, here's your, here's your application. Here's something that you can do right now. The laboratory at Blue Valley that we use to practice hospitality is Sunday school. What I mean by that is the way that we test and improve and live out hospitality is done in our Sunday school class setting. The way that we care and connect and minister to one another is done in that setting. In order for you to best live out this discipline, in order for you to fully live out this command that God has given you is to join a Sunday school class. If you're not regularly involved in one, you're missing out on an awesome thing that God has for you. You're missing out on what God has for you by just showing up here and saying, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to go to service, and then I'm going to go home. Find a Sunday school class. Find a way to get plugged in. I promise you, it it, it will be one of the best decisions that you ever make. If you have trouble finding a Sunday school class, come and talk to one of our staff members. Uh, Send us an email at justgas at at bluevalleychurch.org, and we will get you plugged into one. 
And maybe you're, you're sitting here and you're saying, well, I've been attending the Sunday school class and I, and I love it. I'm not, I'm not really ready uh, to, to give that up. You may be wondering what's next for you. And this is a challenge, right? Because people, they, they get into their communities here. They, they love their Sunday school classes and it's tough for them to give it up. But what's next for you is to come and serve. Come and serve. One of the best ways to get connected and have community and live out hospitality is by immersing yourself in our age-graded ministries. Our children and our students here at Blue Valley need to experience hospitality. They need to know that they're loved, that they're valued, and they need to know that the gospel is for them. It is a rewarding experience, I promise. It is such a blast. And I'm telling you, if you've ever wanted to be challenged in your faith, and if you've ever wanted to be driven to the scriptures with curveball questions... Come down to Big Kids for an hour, right? Hang out with one of our classes, and I'm telling you, they are going to throw some things at you. I, you know, I never really thought about that. I never really thought about that. These are great ways to live out this passage right now, and these are things that, that will sustain you in the long run. But right here and right now, you can do something this morning. As you take a look around this room, as you exit this area, there may be someone in here that you don't know Maybe someone that you don't know very well or someone that you'd like to get to know better. Take a moment, right? Introduce yourself to that person. Invite them to your Sunday school class. Invite them out to lunch, right? I know it can be awkward because I feel that way. And maybe it's just me because I, like, I'm anxious and I'm an overthinker. But it's like, okay, I know that person and I forgot their name and I'm too embarrassed to ask at this point, right? And so you You call them slugger or pal or brother, right? So as as the preacher this morning, I'm going to institute a a rule, a judgment-free zone, where you can ask anyone their name. You're not allowed to be offended. You're not allowed to get mad. You can say, hey, I forgot your name a long time ago. Uh, Tell me what it is again. And there's there's no consequences for that action. Um, Find a way to get to know someone. Invite them to your Sunday school class. Invite them out to lunch. Because hospitality begins right here with the people sitting in this room with you. Like I said earlier, I don't want you to to walk away from this sermon thinking that I've given you a a list of of to-do rules. And hey, do these things and, and, and live by this code. I've not charged you with better, with being a better person. That's not how the gospel works. The gospel does not tell us to do more, be more, or try harder. The gospel tells us that we are not enough, that you cannot do enough, that you cannot try hard enough, but the gospel tells you to be changed, to trust in Jesus. We need a transformation in our hearts. We need a transformation in order to live these things out. You can be the most hospitable person in the world, but if you don't know Jesus, you've missed everything. When we trust in Jesus, he changes our loves, our passions, our priorities. Everything about us changes, and he renews our heart and will drive us to be a more hospitable person. And that starts by beholding Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Here's what Paul is telling us. When we behold Jesus, when we spend time with Jesus in his church, in prayer, in his word, when we spend time, personal time with Jesus, we are transformed to be more like Jesus. When God's Spirit dwells in us, when we feed the Spirit, it causes us to be more like Jesus. So for those of you that have trusted in Jesus, if you want to be a more hospitable person, behold Jesus every day, every morning, Open his word, spend time in prayer. Be made more like Jesus every single day. For those of you that have not had a moment where you have not trusted in Jesus, I want you to understand that God's love is for you. That God cares deeply for you and he wants to know you. He wants a deep relationship with you. That Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect life for you. He died in your place so that you could be reunited with the Father. 
If that is you today and you don't have a story, if you haven't had a moment or you don't know and you're not sure, come and find one of our staff members. Pastor John will be here. Zach will be here. Right? There are elders in this room. I see Kurt Chastain back there. Ask them. Ask them, hey, what has Jesus done for you? What is your life like now that Jesus is coming to? And just have a conversation with them. Find out what that means to have Jesus transform your heart and your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.